There's so much to be done. Um, if you assume, as I do, that the entire spectrum of transportation, road transportation, rail, and air shipping is unsustainable, then it means that we've got a huge amount of work to do to make it sustainable. And um, design has to play an extremely important role in that. And so uh, that's why I'm very optimistic that if designers want it, there's more work than they will know what to do with to, to help solve this problem. Probably the most important one is for designers to be listened to as contributors to solving bigger problems than just designing products or services. And uh, the challenges involved with that mean that designers need to uh, understand a lot more about the larger context of the world that they're designing in. I think there are a variety of bottlenecks and of course one has to consider that pretty well all of our transportation systems now, whether it's uh, the automobile, whether it's trains, shipping, the truck industry, uh, aviation, they're all very mature industries, some of them with well over a hundred years of uh, continu continuity. So there are huge vested interests in the way we do things now. So it's very, very difficult to get people to change uh, a habit that they're used to and they've got business models and manufacturing systems all set up. So um, that's one bottleneck. And of course uh, in the political spectrum there are lots of uh, interests, uh, lots of special interests that are lobbying for politicians not to change the landscape too quickly. So I don't think the I don't think the bottlenecks are actually in technology. There, there, we know that there's quite a lot of interesting technology uh, rapidly uh, being developed. It's more a question of getting uh, the captains of industry, our political leaders, and, uh, and even ourselves as consumers to uh, embrace change. Well, uh, designers do have a, a, a huge opportunity to uh, steward these changes through the processes. And to do that, as I said earlier, the designers need to uh, see their role as being much larger than just concentrating on products and services to design. They really need to look at the complete system of transportation and they need to understand the contexts in which these transportation systems are going to be operating. They have to, they have to use systems thinking as part of their process. And they also have to learn, or not learn perhaps, but they have to be prepared, I should say, to step outside their comfort zones of the, of the familiar design community and actually roll their sleeves up and start uh, being heard by people beyond the normal, uh, the normal audience. Designers tend to work uh, within a, their own community. So they're proposing ideas to familiar customers or within the, in their design studios. Now they need to get out there and actually start talking to some of the uh, leaders of industry. They need to get to understand a lot more about what the public really wants and they need to understand how the political system works so that they can make useful contributions to, to the conversations that go on. I happen to think that the automobile uh, with large qualifications can play a large part in our future transportation, but um, designers need to understand that the car is no longer serving the needs of a large section of the population. It's serving maybe needs in terms of status and, uh, and desirability as an object, but the truth is in many parts of the world, particularly here in Southern California, it's not actually a very effective means of mobility any longer because we have so much gridlock. Designers need to address that. They need to think about in their own industry, if, if they work in the car industry, what, what can we do? How, how do we change our thinking to make the automobile a much more valuable contribution uh, or contributor to our whole, whole uh, system? But also, um, there are such huge opportunities for designers in the transportation arena in the automobile industry or beyond to work on other forms of transportation as well. You know, I've said many times that the car gets all of the passion, if you like, in the design world. So much of the design work that goes into automobile design 
is done by people who are really passionate about cars. Then when you look at people who design, or I shouldn't say the people who design, but when you look at the, how buses or transit, uh, trains, how they're designed, where's the passion there? And I think there's a clear correlation between uh, encouraging people to embrace different kinds of transportation when they can feel that there's some excitement in, in using that transportation. So designers have a lot of opportunity to, uh, as I say, export their passion from what they do in, typically in the car industry to other forms of transportation right across the spectrum. Well, I think the starting point is to not just consider the bus itself. I mean, it would be pretty easy to design a bus that had comfortable leather seats and fine audio and a little bit more space. Uh, the difficulty is designing that into a, a, a system or a service uh, to make it affordable. But we also have to look beyond the bus itself to the complete experience of using the bus. So designers need to get involved in thinking about the complete journey. What does it mean for somebody to leave their home in the morning to catch a bus to go to work, for instance? How do they get to the bus stop? What's the experience of waiting for the bus? What's the experience on the bus, of course? And then when they get off the bus, how do they get to the rest, how do they make the rest of the journey? So all of these things need to be seamlessly integrated. And it's a question of, I think, giving people the feeling that they they have the same level of control over their journey by using the bus as they would if they instead went to the garage, stepped into their car, took their car right to the outside of their workplace. So that's where designers need to focus their attention on, say, designing buses. Consider the whole experience, not just the bus. And looking at street furniture, bus shelters, the, the connectivity that we have with all of our um, uh, uh, technology available now so that customers know how long it will be before they have to wait for the bus. Maybe the bus, maybe they don't have to go and wait at a particular spot for the bus in the future. Maybe the bus will know to come make a small diversion and come and collect them from where it's convenient. So it's the total experience. Well, of course, it would be fabulous if we could start from scratch. And indeed, there are a few places in the world where I think they're managing to uh, at least consider doing that. We're, we're very well aware of uh, major projects to build cities in the Middle East, like Mazdar, and uh, in China there are supposedly a number of big cities that are going to be built from scratch. Then, with sensible planning and inspired design, uh, it's possible to in incorporate a transportation system that's seamless uh, for the citizens of those cities. Unfortunately, the vast majority of us live in well-established cities and urban environments. And so, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of saying to uh, residents of Los Angeles or Atlanta or Phoenix, sorry, you've got to go move somewhere else for 10 years while we completely reconstruct the city. It doesn't work like that. So in many ways, we do have to do both. Wherever possible, we need to, we need to um, introduce revolutionary new ideas into new cities and new environments, but where we have entrenched environments, we have to build upon what we've, what we've got. But I am fairly optimistic that uh, given the right, uh, the right inspiration and the right opportunities, that can be done to good effect. If you're going to ask people to use an alternative to the car, or maybe the car is only part of their journey and they use other means of transportation as well. Uh, it has to be as seamless as possible. So people need to know that if they use their car for the first mile of the journey to the railroad station or the transit station, that they can just drive straight there, find somewhere to park, and then they can step pretty much straight onto the next transportation system. They need to know in advance whether there are likely to be any hiccups in the service. Passengers need to know that they're, they're in control of the journey. Uh, the physical environment has to be um, safe. 
the physical environment has to be comfortable and uh, these, are, these are quite large tasks. But you know, multimodal transport works a lot in established cities already. If you go to the East Coast, uh, New York, or some of the European and Asian cities, London, Paris, Tokyo, people do have uh, a lot of options uh, and multimodal transit. In those cities, there are a lot of people who choose not to own a vehicle because they know they have an array of buses or subways. Uh, other forms of uh, transit which they can hop on and off and it all connects well. It, it, it surprises a lot of people to know how much public transit there is for instance in, in Los Angeles. Um, and I have to say that there are huge efforts going on in Los Angeles to make it work better. There's a way to go yet. But the issues in the past have been that each part of the system, whether it's the surface buses or the light rail system, they're, they operate as autonomous systems and they don't speak to each other. So we've got the multimodal transit, but what we haven't got is the seamlessness of being able to go from one to the other and knowing very easily how to get from point A to B in a city, uh, even if, you don't particular, if, you, if you're not particularly familiar with the city. I think there's an inevitability that we're going to see a lot more hybrid vehicles of, of, of various categories and uh, plug-in electrics. Um, there are people who have uh, significant doubts about them, and there are other people who think that they are the holy grail of, trans uh, of automobiles at the moment. The plug-in electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid, uh, makes total sense when the source energy that uh, creates the electricity to charge them up is clean and totally renewable and when the batteries which uh, store the electricity for the duration of the journey uh, are also have uh, life cycle analysis you know they're totally ecologically clean and we're a ways away from that right now the vehicle companies that are investing a lot of uh, money in R&D in hybrids and plug-in hybrids are doing the right thing because they're discovering a lot of aspects of these technologies that will be a great help later on. So uh, I run a hybrid myself and um, have done for a long time. I figured that I better put my money where my mouth was and see what it means. Uh, there, are, there are some, if, if I were to do a complete life cycle analysis of the, uh, of the hybrid vehicle, um, it's a little touch and go as to whether it's uh, better than a regular car, but from I, I feel that in some ways a consumer I'm contributing to the, if you like, the knowledge curve of, of building these. Uh, there, are, there are a number of advantages, of course, of uh, battery electric vehicles or hybrids that they, at the point of uh, the, the vehicle itself uh, has much lower emissions, they're much quieter, which actually is causing a little bit of a debate now because they're too quiet. But uh, in the long run, I think, I think there's a great future. But it, as I said, it's really dependent on the future of our uh, source energy generation and the ability to uh, develop batteries which are uh, clean and completely recyclable. I, I, my gut feeling is I, I have some optimism that we will see a lot more of these. And the other thing that we have to remember is that um, whilst the car industry has done a fantastic job, uh, admittedly under some protest in the beginning, to clean uh, internal combustion engines up. Uh, the fact is that we are arguably at or beyond peak oil, and quite soon the cost of oil-based products is going to start going up and up and up, uh, at least uh, going through a spate of uh, volatility as well. And so we really do have to uh, we do really do have to figure out how to uh, eke out the oil that we've got left much more efficiently than we than we have up to now. We've we've kind of been spoilt because a, a liter or a gallon of gasoline or diesel oil contains so much energy compared to its equivalent weight of a battery that it's hands down the winner in terms of energy efficiency. The problem is we've squandered it and we have used it uh, in applications where uh, we've assumed that we have a finite supplies of it. That isn't the case any longer. So I think, um, I think we're going to see forms of hybrids which 
inevitably are going to use internal combustion engines for a while, but in ways that greatly reduce the amount of uh, gas consumption of those engines while they're in use. I would say all of them, really, because there is not one answer f that fits all. Um, as I say, we have some cities which function quite nicely with, uh, with alternative transportation systems now. Um, if you visit a lot of those cities, you'll find that those systems are, are, are quite old. They've been so successful uh, that they are pretty tired. And uh, because of the economic and political climate that we live in, in say Europe and particularly in the United States, there, isn't, there hasn't been so much political or economic will to invest public money in keeping those systems up to scratch. So, so we've been ignoring those in some ways. Uh, I think we've been definitely ignoring in the USA uh, the role that uh, trains can play in the total landscape. Uh, trains are not necessarily the most energy efficient way of getting people around under certain conditions uh, compared to other forms of ground transportation. But on the other hand, they, uh, they have the opportunity to be quite convenient, safe and clean. Where I think they do have a, an opportunity is against uh, air traffic, uh, particularly for cities that are only two or three hundred miles apart. Using a high-speed train between two cities becomes uh, quite compelling compared to using aircraft. Um, buses, I would say, are offer significant opportunities, uh, particularly in somewhere like Southern California, which the predominant infrastructure are roads and highways, uh, where it is very difficult to retrofit um, light rail or subways for a variety of reasons. Uh, we need to make much better bus systems. And um, unfortunately, compared to Europe or Asia, or perhaps even on the East Coast, where people are more comfortable using buses, in Southern California, people would rather do penal servitude in Venezuela than actually ride on a bus. And yet, there are, there are huge, huge advantages from a systems point of view of introducing bus fleets. And um, one must take their hat off to uh, MTA in Los Angeles. They've been doing a fantastic job of uh, building better bus systems and bus routes for us all to use. We need to keep on doing that. We need to make it easier for people to, to make those journeys which are really not, they shouldn't be using an automobile, not particularly convenient to use a bus, and certainly doesn't make sense to use a subway. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to consider those, and, and lots of people have been working with the question of the first and last mile of journeys. So helping people use uh, bicycles or electric bicycles or segways or uh, other very personal systems to, to, to help make those journeys. And of course, we shouldn't forget that actually the best way of getting around from a health and ecological point of view is to walk and uh, we need to get better as we redevelop cities or build new cities to make it much more compelling for people to walk. Of course, you can look at some cities that have done this very well. If you look at cities like uh, Montreal or Toronto in, it, uh, in uh, Canada, uh, where of course they have very severe winters, it's still possible to walk around downtown uh, underground. Um, it's, it's important. We, we, need, we need to make sure that people uh, feel uh, not only able to, but actually quite interested in the idea of walking. And again, I'm sure our listeners are familiar with certain cities or towns in their life where it's fun to walk places or it's fun to cycle somewhere. Um, and then there are other places where it either feels threatening or it feels dangerous or indeed there is no facility to be able to walk. Probably the biggest challenge is uh, as the global economy um, proceeds, uh, the cost of energy is going to, um, as I said earlier, is inevitably going to rise. And it will start to make, in some ways, less and less economic sense to ship goods that are being made in one continent halfway around the world to the other. Um, you know, it's already part of the uh, conversations 
daily conversations about the wisdom of uh, drinking water that's been bottled in Fiji uh, when you live in California or, or Paris or somewhere like that. But it could also apply to a lot of other things. So I think with transportation, uh, we may see a reduction in a few decades of uh, a lot of um, long distance transportation of goods as we get better and better at uh, producing goods and food much closer to where we live. Uh, so I think the cost of energy is, uh, is going to be one of the challenges and we see it already. You know, Most people who complain that the cost of food in the supermarkets is going up think it's all a, a conspiracy against them. It's probably because the cost of actually transporting the goods, uh, let alone the raw materials, which have to be transported as well, uh, are increasing quite dramatically. Well, if you look at the history of the automobile, there have never really been any radical changes. I don't see any radical changes or step changes in the uh, near future, at least. But I think we're, perhaps we will see some bigger changes than in the past. I believe that if we're going to continue to use automobiles in any big way, we have to be much more selective as uh, end users in making sure we use the right vehicle for the right job, the right tool for the right job, the right car for the right journey. And you mentioned a little earlier you know, how 85, 87% of people still use the car for their commuting rather than uh, other means of transportation. So the reality is that most of those car journeys are done alone. So why do we haul around uh, ourselves in a vehicle that's 20 or 30 times our own weight? Uh, because it's got three, four or five, six, seven sometimes empty seats around us. Uh, those vehicles are fine when they're used uh, to carry a lot of people. But so I think one of the changes that I believe we need to see uh, is a, a much greater uh, opportunity for people to, to use whether it's through buying or sharing uh, vehicles specifically for commuting. They'll be as safe, they'll be much more energy efficient, use up less space, and then you can make a better case for using cars. So I think the architecture of vehicles will, will, will start to see much smaller vehicles. Um, I think that one of the, uh, one of the big issues of, the, of vehicle design too is the uh, crash avoidance technology that we're beginning to see being introduced. Personally, my own opinion is that if the automobile is to uh, remain a major player in uh, personal mobility, then I think autonomous vehicles are going to be a real, um, a real advantage. Uh, some people think this is crazy and is not possible. Uh, I and quite a few other people think that this is not crazy and there are some really good reasons why we should go that way. We're kind of on the way now. Um, how will this affect the way cars look? As I've said, we're going to see cars that I uh, hope we'll see more cars on the road that are much smaller. We've seen some examples at recent auto shows. Volkswagen and some of the Japanese companies have shown much smaller vehicles. Uh, there is still a lot of reticence amongst car users that they're not as safe as driving around in a big car. That needn't be the case. Small cars can be engineered to be extremely safe. They still have to pass all the same crash regulations that a big car does. So a lot of it is about perceptions. Uh, at the same time, if cars can be engineered to drive themselves reliably without crashing into each other, then you can make the cars a lot lighter still because you don't have to engineer them to be like tanks. I think uh, given the right circumstances, um, we could see vehicles that are able to drive by themselves in, within a decade. But that's under ideal circumstances. The, the, the main barrier that people flag up with autonomous driving is Yes, but how do you mix cars that can drive themselves with older cars that can't drive themselves? And so actually introducing these autonomous cars into the legacy fleet is, the, is, the, is a, a challenge, but I believe it's quite possible. Honestly, I think it's probably 20 or 30 years away before 
we see a landscape, a, a, a car landscape where all cars are driving themselves. But I often think, what would it be like if we, if we transported ourselves a hundred years into the future, or imagine our great-great-grandchildren, and they say, Grandad, is it true that in 2010 people were allowed to drive their own cars around? Yep, that's absolutely true. I say, well, that's crazy. Didn't people crash into each other and make mistakes? Yes, they did, and 40,000 people a year died every year on, the, on American roads because they crashed into each other, and goodness knows how many people got injured. Wow, so how is that allowed to last for so long? I think if you look at that perspective, you can see it becomes an inevitability. That, but I would say 20 or 30 years before it becomes ubiquitous. But I think we, can, we see it. We see the beginnings of it now. There are a lot of vehicles now which have adaptive speed control on, their, um, on the cruise control, adaptive cruise control. If the car gets too close to the one in front, the brakes automatically come on. Most people who drive very powerful sports cars have uh, subliminal systems built into the car which uh, apply the brakes a little bit uh, discreetly or, or stop the wheel spinning if the driver is too enthusiastic or too aggressive. Uh, we have devices that warn you if you try to change lanes when there's somebody still on your blind spot. And we also have now in some cars that uh, being introduced that if, if the car feels that you have not seen a pedestrian step out in front of you or it's getting too close to a stationary object, it'll slam on the brakes uh, without the driver, before the driver even reacts. So you can imagine these kinds of technologies becoming more and more ubiquitous in the cars so that the car kind of in the end surreptitiously takes over from the driver then you can see the driver beginning to take less and less interest in the driving. And that, to me, is the way we introduce them into the legacy fleet. Of course, it will depend on which cities we're talking about. Um, I think that we will see uh, variations between different parts of the world and different parts of the United States. I would... My prognosis is that the biggest game changer in the future of cities by 2050 will be the technology at the moment which is rapidly erupting uh, in connectivity. Um, you know, it often, it often occurs to me that a lot of the travel that we do in our current environment is not travel that we really want to do. It's because we work somewhere distant from where we live. And I would like to think that in the cities in 2050, generally each area of a, a large city will become more community-based. So there will be a lot more options for people not to have to move around in the first place. So rather than commute 20 or 30 miles across a big city, we'll have the opportunity to do a lot of our work, maybe not all of it, but a lot of our work quite close to where we live. Uh, that we need to get away from the idea that we live in large dormitory areas and then we have all of our work and industry and uh, office space in another area. Uh, there are plenty of good examples of how you can uh, mix, uh, mix the zones up and still make a very livable and enjoyable uh, environment for people to live in. So rather than a commute being uh, a couple of hours out of every day, uh, maybe a commute means just a couple of minutes. Ooh, that's more difficult to uh, that's more difficult to say. I think if the human race is still around in a hundred years, uh, it means that we have um, we've been hung very much over the edge of the cliff, and we ha will have got good at a lot of things. I think uh, I think uh, even maybe by 2050, uh, I mentioned it a little before we will probably be uh, moving goods a lot less than food. We will be needing to grow a lot of the food and, uh, and the goods that we consume. Uh, we need to produce that much more locally to where we live rather than divorcing it from the cities. We need to become more integrated and the same with work. 
uh, I think that would be far more community-based. In some ways, it will require us to, to go backwards a little. Maybe we'll be living in smaller, but at the same time, much more desirable living spaces. Uh, we will, I mean, it, it's just, it's so difficult to predict what technologies we'll have available in, um, in 90 years' time. It's difficult enough in 50 years' time, but, so it's really difficult to say. So, if we've got cities in 2100, uh, it makes me very optimistic that we'll be still around. We'll be, if we're still around, it means we figured out how to do a lot of things much better than we're doing now. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to uh, making sure that we, we really are designing to uh, solve problems that need solving. And, um, you know, it, over the span of my career, the word design uh, has gone from being uh, a word that most people don't really understand to a word that people, most people think they understand it. Uh, but sometimes it's misrepresented. Design and styling are sometimes interchanged a little. And I think with design, um, it, it's very much an onus of the design community to make sure that we are in the general conversation about what needs to be done in the bigger picture, that we need to be working very honestly with ourselves and with other people about what it is we're designing for, how we go about it, and at the same time, we need to think on a much bigger scale. Uh, I talk about it a lot, but the world is going to is is getting more and more complex as the as days go by, as the years go by. As designers, we have to become systems thinkers all of the time. That's extremely important, and so. Everything we do has to be an honest statement of what really needs to be done. Well, it, actually in the field of transportation design, I, I, don't see, I don't see any step changes coming along at the moment. Uh, everybody's working very hard to make useful incremental changes. So we have... Um, vehicle manufacturers and train manufacturers and aircraft manufacturers who are, who are trying to make vehicles lighter and more energy efficient. Uh, we have people working on figuring out new ways of manufacturing that require uh, or, or result, I should say, in less uh, toxic waste stream into the environment. Uh, looking at uh, renewable materials, uh, which, uh, which can be used time and time again, true recycling. Uh, we see a lot of uh, effort to, to use uh, less oil or gasoline in, in our internal combustion engines. Game Changers, uh, Project Better Place, uh, Shire Gas's Project Better Place is kind of interesting. Uh, somebody really putting their head on the block with, a, with an idea for helping the emergence of battery electric vehicles, which is building up quite a lot of uh, momentum now and support from one or two uh, vehicle companies. Uh, that, that could be a game changer. I think the real game changer will come from, or changes should, will come from, uh, from technologies that are being developed for other kinds of um, outcomes and industries which uh, which will create unprecedented uh, and unintended consequences which could could help trans the transportation landscape and I'll mention again you know the, the game changes that we see in a mobile communication uh, that's very exciting and uh, a lot of that can really displace some of the need to move ourselves around a lot of the time. Uh, so I think the main game changes for transportation are going to come unexpectedly from areas that we're, we were not thinking about. Uh, meanwhile, we've got, I think that the, the biggest game changer has to be the way we all think about the way we move ourselves and goods around. And we've got to get different um, we, people need to understand actually the unsustainability of what we're doing at the moment and uh, it, it's uh, 
we're so used to our environment around us. We're so used to the way we do things. We're so used to our living patterns that it's very difficult for us to question the absurdity of it all. Uh, which is why I like to go out 100 or 200 years into the future sometimes and kind of look back through those retro binoculars and think, my God, how did we, how did we get away with doing that? And I think that um, that's, that, that's our real challenge as designers. We have to think on a systems basis, but we have to help all of the different constituents see that there can be not only a better sustainable way of doing things, particularly in transportation, but it'd actually be much more fun and desirable than what we, how we do it already.